Hello world! I'm Just David, and this is my first video on the topic of Gamergate. What's the topic? I say like you haven't read the video title. The topic is griefers with an eye towards showing some relevant information through a few news articles around the internet. So let's get this train wreck a wrecking. This article is from Wired.com, titled Mutilated Furries, Flying Phalluses. Put the blame on griefers, the sociopaths of the world. This article, published January 19th, 2008 describes a character appearing in the sky, causing freakish objects to rain down, immobilizing characters with code that force them to log off or immobilize their characters and make them shout, Get to the choppa! Note, I suck at impersonations, so I'm not even going to try. Similar attacks against denizens of Second Life happened all over their world. These attacks were maintained for this entire night, accounts being banned and new accounts being opened all the while until the aggressors finally crashed many of the Second Life servers. These attacks were carried out by a group called the Patriotic Nigras. I hope I pronounced that correctly. A faction of a larger griefing clan called Goon Squad. Similar attacks against denizens of Second Life happened all over their world. These attacks were maintained for this entire night, accounts being banned and new accounts being created for the entire duration. They claim they aren't racist, but use racism as one of their many tools to try and push users past the brink of moral outrage to the point where they find themselves crying over a computer game. They are all about getting that kind of response. When asked why they do this, a representative said, Most of us are psychotic. This article goes into further details about griefing and goon squat, and covers far more, including how this impacts people who employ themselves through the Second Life community and how griefing affects them. It goes on to cover EVE Online and more, including what the article calls the long and bloodless history of death threats among internet commentators. Don't worry, there's more to look forward to. More than I'm going to show you. GamePolitics.com has an article on another Second Life incident published in 2006. This time, CNET was doing an in-game interview. During this interview, someone unleashed flying penises on the interview, and eventually, this resulted in another server crash. Here we have EVE Online. This game is a very complex one that involves scales of economy that I don't think the average person would even imagine could exist in an online game. When it comes to showcasing human endeavors, EVE pretty much has it all, including good and evil in spades. EVE is the best example I can think of as to how much time, effort, and energy people can put into ruining things for other people, either just to do it or for their own personal gain. This article is from eve.blackie.net and isn't dated, but I believe was published in 2005. It describes a group that, for hire, infiltrates other corporations for nefarious ends. They spent a year planning an assassination and robbery of a CEO target. According to the article, this is legal in the game's rules, and PC Gamer estimated the value of the theft at $16,500, and notes that these assets take years to acquire. From here on out, I'll be referencing Crack.com, which is a source of interesting lists, including such gems as this one, the seven most elaborate dick moves in online gaming history. I'll also use entries from the six most spectacular dick moves in online gaming history, the seven biggest dick moves in the history of online gaming, and finally, the five biggest dick moves in the history of online gaming, part five. All these articles are from 2011 and later. First is an article about Angui, someone who, on one server, camped a bottleneck between several mid-level zones and killed everyone he possibly could, noting that not only was he on an incredible portion of the time, which seems to me might have involved more than one person on the account, but there were also FAQs written about how to get past him. EVE Online again. And this one involves EVE's in-game currency that is used to fund subscriptions. You buy it just like a one-month subscription and get an in-game currency called Plex. Plex can be traded and is, according to this article, moved like the rest of the in-game cargo, subjecting it to dropping when a ship carrying it is destroyed. A couple of players found a cargo hauler carrying 74 Plex and blew it up. Not one flex survived, causing the loss of $1,100 of player money that would never be recovered by a player. Ashran's Call ran a year-long story triggered by a player shattering particular crystals. A group called Defenders of the Shard set up camp around one of the crystals and defended it for 24 hours a day. In Ashran's Call, monsters can level up by killing players, 
and the group not only defended the crystal, but continually sacrificed themselves to it to make it almost unkillable. It gets even worse, sadly. The developers, instead of doing something like altering the crystal, went in-game with powerful characters, and recruited two high-level characters, two high-level players, that were in the storyline, and it seems needed to kill the crystal to progress. However, one of them was a plant and turned on the admins during the fight. The administrators lost the fight in their own game. The article also claims that when they tried to de-level the crystal, it didn't respond to the command. This article says the staff tried again, which I assume means they tried another assault, were rebuffed again, and finally won on the third attempt. Although they did put up a monument to the defenders and the battle that they fought. This does seem a bit good-natured, but no matter the intention of the majority of the defenders, surely some of them were in it for no other reason than to prevent other players from getting to complete this quest. Ultima Online. The game had slimes that split every time they were hit, and they regenerated health. One player trapped slimes in his house and started hitting them with weak alchemical potions that would explode to damage all enemies in the area of effect. Slimes were capable of stacking on top of each other, allowing the player to create exponential numbers of them. When he opened the door to his house, the world was flooded with slime. According to the article, it killed all the players on the server and then crashed the server. Apparently, he demanded a ransom to not do it again the next day, and when it wasn't paid, he made good on his threat. The developers removed the slime's ability to split. Band of Brothers, Bob, were one of the most powerful alliances in EVE Online, to the point where accusations were made that they were in league with the game developers, which was, according to this article, true. There was a war between Bob and a faction of Goon Squad mentioned earlier called Goon Swarm. A high-level director of Bob defected to Goon Squad. He transferred large amounts of war material to the Goon Swarm, then hit the Disband Guild button. Goonswarm even managed to register Band of Brothers as a new, empty alliance. Then a year later, the Goonswarm CEO did the same thing. He kicked out almost all the other corporations from the alliance, transferred the assets of the remaining corporations to the empty Band of Brothers alliance, then, after making sure that the passwords were completely secure, abandoned the game, locking all these assets out from any player access ever. In World of Warcraft, a Horde guild was holding an in-game funeral for a friend who had died in real life and was attacked by an alliance guild that killed all the attendees. Again, in Warcraft, the developers introduced a boss that caused a hit point drain effect on the players next to it. Since the effect was guaranteed to kill you and limited to a dungeon, they made it contagious. Some players then figured out how to get out of the dungeon and into the greater world of WoW while still infected. The plague killed new characters almost instantly and, as it turned out, could infect NPCs, turning them to typhoid marys to continually spread the plague to people who talked to them. And here we finally have a story in EverQuest. EverQuest employed people called guides, who had special functionality in-game, to help resolve issues, things like being stuck in a wall and not being able to get out to play the game. One guide summoned a group of players to the path of a giant dragon and bound them to it, keeping them from being able to leave. Even death didn't unbind their characters, forcing them to respawn again and again just to be killed by the dragon. RuneScape, a free browser-based MMO, suffered an event called the Faldor Massacre. A player held a party to celebrate maxing his construction skill. The party got so big that the player was forced to boot the attendees back into the city. Players who had been playing the party's combat minigame discovered that they were still flagged as able to kill people, despite being back in the city and out of the combat minigame. Some of these players immediately started killing everyone around them. No one could fight back, and they could steal items from defeated players. In some cases, they looted very valuable items from the people they defeated. This went on for an hour before moderators arrived to stop it. A WoW player named Swifty had 100,000 followers and was holding a WoW livestreaming event. Someone called the police with Swifty's home address, claiming that someone was being threatened with a knife. The police arrived, and the live stream had to be cancelled for Swifty to go to the station to fill out forms. Minecraft. Several players demanding more free updates created a DDoS attack against the Minecraft servers, shutting them down. Notch had apparently already posted a schedule for the free updates and was working on them before the attack occurred, making this the most pointless attack in the set, unless, of course, it was just a flimsy excuse to attack Minecraft. Once again, EVE Online. I think you know the trend by now. 
someone profiting doing something nasty to a lot of other people. In this case, a person created his own banking game. He offered loans with interest rates, repayments, and savings. Then, after a long time in operation, he took all the money and basically closed the bank, making off with 790 billion units worth of the in-game currency called ISK, worth somewhere around $170,000. And he didn't stop at that. He put a bounty on himself and made a video mocking everyone who he had victimized, including his employees and anyone that had put money into his bank. And there we are. A lot of examples of bad behavior, awful behavior, and unconscionable behavior. Some of you might be wondering why I'm bringing this up in relation to Gamergate, if I'm in support of Gamergate. The point is, there are toxic people here. As gamers, as a community, we've been dealing with them for a long time. The vast majority of us just want to continue to enjoy our games and would love to have other people enjoy the games with us. But there are people out there that will go through elaborate measures to ruin things for anyone they can. Of course, goons justify their behavior. We're just finding the flaws for the developers. And many people will say, it's just a game. Don't let it get to you. Which I will call out as stupidly and arrogantly dismissive. Online games can be an important part of many people's lives. They are communities. You form friendships and social relationships. There have been people who have met in an online game and gotten married later. Sometimes it's an important part of someone's ability to cope with the rest of their life. Get online, play this game they enjoy, and visit with friends doing the same. And these griefers will delight in turning this into genuine anguish with no regard for anything. I believe that some of these people will be willing to threaten a rape victim with rape just to cause them trauma. They form clans and sometimes plot elaborate schemes. I've seen claims that some clans require their members to give them money before they join, which they then use to fund their efforts, and I assume also to profit leaders of the clan. They are willing to put years of effort into accomplishing these things. Gamers, as a whole, are not to blame for the actions of these deeply malignant people. They are some of the worst of the internet as a whole, and they will show up. They will try to ruin people's lives. They get a thrill from watching things burn down, and I'll bet that plenty of them would get the greatest thrill of their life to burn down gaming as a culture. Some of these groups are more than willing to infiltrate both sides of an issue and stoke the fire until it explodes and destroys everything. So when you demonize Gamergate as a whole, denying everyone new and old, their voice because you see people being harassed, or you yourself are being harassed by people claiming to be Gamergate, you are enabling these people. You do not give us a chance to separate ourselves from them. I believe the worst of the people vilifying Gamergate are those in the gaming news that know these people exist, that have reported on them, and yet are damning a huge demographic of gamers on the actions that will likely come just from griefers. We have records throughout the history of gaming of small numbers of very dedicated malcontents trying to destroy someone's love for something and the thing that they love. We, as Gamergate, are not them and do not deserve to be treated like we are. Finally, I want to note that engaging in harassing tactics is awful. Even if they manage to shut someone down, it's not only damning to the opposition of the person who has been shut down, but it does not address the root cause of why that person was speaking up or being listened to. No matter who you support, I sincerely ask that you don't engage in these tactics. All they really do is serve to create a lot more drama and strife. And if you truly support any position being caught engaging in such awful tactics, only hurts the side you claim to support. If you're upset or enraged by seeing people you know, or someone you admire being harassed by such tactics, do not retaliate in kind. Take a break and see if you can calm down. Remember that the best thing to do in the face of internet harassment is to ignore the harassments you can and gather evidence and facts to hold up in the face of those you can't ignore. I'd also like to say that experiencing these emotions is natural. You're not a bad person for feeling angry or being upset or even feeling a desire to retaliate and lash out. What matters is how you act. 
how you compose yourself, and how you deal with your feelings. What matters is who you choose to be, not how you feel. I hope that this video is helpful in adding context to the social contentions of Gamergate, illustrating the actions that griefers and trolls are willing to engage in to stir the pot, and provide everyone involved with useful information to help resolve the issues we're facing. In an upcoming video, I plan to go over Gamergate as a movement, including, among other thoughts I have on the topic, why I believe that rallying under the label of Gamergate is important, and why identifying yourself as Gamergate or pro-Gamergate is an important thing in the face of the social issues facing gamers.